What's going on YouTube, it's Teej, back again with another video. And today we're going over my week 16 NFL power rankings. Whether you're new or a returning v viewer here, you get the gist of what we're doing here. We're talking about who's moving up, who's moving down, and who is staying put post week 15 NFL action. Uh, I do wanna just get a quick note in here. I'll probably be rather quick with this video, time constraints and whatnot, but also at this point, my opinions on these teams are pretty well known and you don't need me to hear me kind of reinvent the wheel um, on these squads. So we'll fly through it. You know, starting with the Carolina Panthers, they did get a win. Um, but I'm still going to have him stay at 32. Um, I just, I, it's still a struggle, man. Like, it felt like they had to put together 15 play drives just to get nine points, just to get three field goals. So good on Carolina getting the W. I don't want to, like, downgrade that, but came in a super sloppy game um, against a not great opponent, I'll be honest. Um, and, and, I mean, it still took a lot of things to go right. Um, so, yeah, the Panthers. And, and I mean, like, yeah, Patriots, Commanders, they're also bad. You know, the Giants got another loss. They're 5-9 and nine now. But, yeah, I think the Panthers are still soundly the worst team in the league, and they have the worst record to back it up. Uh, Patriots, just a bad football team. So, um, saw their offense get a little more, more exploited than we have most of the season. Good, really, to see the Chiefs get back on track. Bailey Zappi's just not good. Like, And if you, have, if you didn't know that now, you definitely know it after this week. Commanders are down on the spot. You see the change to Jacoby Brissett. He actually makes things interesting. And Terry McLaurin all of a sudden starts getting the football and try to beg for me on my fantasy team. So that's that's awesome. But um, makes you wonder that, you know, if Sam Howell is going to remain the starter, like how much work is he doing with 17 this week trying to get that ironed out? But, um, you know, I think he elevated the level of play. But you also know what Jacoby Brissett is. You know, there's nothing long term that's doing anything for the commanders other than finding out if Sam Howell could be their starter next year. So, um, yeah, tough performance from him. He's taking a lot of sacks. The O-line sucks, you know, um, and, and the defense is also putrid. The, the commanders are just a bad team. Giants, they're down a spot as well. Uh, DeVito kind of fell back to earth, um, which, you know, was kind of bound to happen, right? Like, he can still be an okay backup, but still hit reality and stop winning games that he shouldn't. Um, we'll talk about the Saints a little bit later on, but really good game plan, I think, put together. Uh, it felt like I was seeing them put a lot of pressure via the blitz on that giant O line, which makes a lot of sense because it's a bad unit. And DeVito just, you know, it was a chance to see him see what he's going to do with that, you know, that pressure in his face. Um, and can he overcome, you know, blizzards being set on him? And I think Sunday we saw the answer is uh, no. So kind of a step back into what more of what we expect the Giants to be uh, with a loss to the Saints. Raiders are up a handful of spots. I mean, they wiped the floors with the Chargers. I mean, so much so that the Chargers cleaned house the next day, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But um, yeah, I mean, I think Antonio Pierce is going to keep this team competitive. It feels like they want to play hard for him. And that was a stark difference. Like one side did not want to play for their head coach and one side did. I mean, that's what we saw on Thursday night in my eyes. Uh, Titans are going to have him stay put. They battled hard to the end. And, you know, assuming Will Loves is going to be okay, he showed a lot of uh, spunk. I will say the offense, you know, after their first, you know, handful of drives, really got quiet quick, you know? Uh, so we'd love to see more consistency out of that offense. DeAndre Hopkins uncharacteristically quiet in this one, which is a little strange, um, but still generally encouraged by where this team is at, kind of heading in the right direction, I think, with Will Levis. Pieces to fix up on the offensive line, the defense as a whole. So it feels like they're an offseason or two away, but, you know, they're also at 27, not much lower I can drop them. Cardinals, they're also going to stay where they are. Same thing with the Jets. You know, the Jets, it wasn't it wasn't pretty. Like, let's not try to sell ourselves on anything other than that. Losing to the Dolphins 30 to nothing without Tyree Kill. But you'll see the teams ahead of them. There's not really another place to move them. And you see the teams below them. I I, I feel comfortable where they're at. They got a good defense, and that's more than I can say for most of the teams on this side of the screen. Um, as for the Cardinals, you know, they ran to the 49ers. You know, <laughs> that's it's been happening to a lot of teams this season. Uh, Bears and Falcons album stay put. The Bears are a tough one, man. This is, you know, I got to talk about Justin Fields here. Like, I go to that touchdown pass they had against Cole Komet, um, and like that play, sick. But literally, the play before that, the second and goal throw, was a very makeable throw. Like, it's just an out route. The guy won the route, and he just airmailed the throw out of bounds. Like, that's a throw you gotta hit, and it's six right there. So then he goes out and follows it up by making up for it, <laughs> spinning out of a sack, and, you know, cross body, dart to the back of the end zone, finding Cole Komet in the corner, tiptoe catch, six points for the Bears. Like, it's like the true Justin Fields experience right there, which, I mean, we'll talk about the just Joe Flacco experience later on when we get to the Browns, but man, man. So, you know, it's still up and down for Fields, but that being said, Robert Tunyon's also dropping six points, too. So, like, I don't know. Like, he's still so hard to get a gauge on. So, I still want more, you know, Justin Fields sample size. I want to see how he plays the next three weeks um, before we go and make a decision. Also, it's going to come down to, I mean, I assume the Panthers are going to have the number one pick, um, but, you know, what the offers for that selection are, if the Panthers find another way to win a game or two, do they even have the number one selection? So, so a lot of things to be figured out before we make a full assessment on what the Bears should do at quarterback. I still lean in the direction of that they should take someone, reset that rookie contract window, but 
I don't know, Fields might play out of his mind the next three weeks. And you see some of that flashes and some of those plays that are still there. Uh, and then we get to the Falcons at 23. Yeah, they lost the Panthers, but again, in a super rainy game, Bijan fumbles, you know, like a lot of things broke against the Falcons. Um, and in that type of weather, like I think that highlights the Desmond Ritter limitations. Like, because if I'm the Carolina Panthers, I am putting eight in the box and saying, you are not going to win us. You're not going to beat us with your ground game. We know you can run the ball well. We know that's what Arthur Smith draws up well and, and designs he's really good at designing that stuff. We're going to take it away. We're going to force you to win with Desmond Ritter throwing the football through this rain. And obviously the Falcons just couldn't do it. That being said, they only allowed nine points and it was, you know, three long drives from the Panthers that ended in field goals. Like most of the time that wins you a lot of games. So I still think the Falcons defense is solid. Like, I don't know, like the pieces that are there in Atlanta that I like, you know, like if you've been watching these, you understand there are things I like about Atlanta. It's just a lot of things I can't buy into chieftain of them all. Desmond Ritter, especially when conditions are what they were in Carolina this last week. Chargers are down five spots, and trust me, they're they're heading down even harder. They dropped, like, I think four spots last week, then five more this week, and trust me, Falcons, Bears, Jets, Cardinals, Titans fans, I know what you're all saying. Like, the Chargers, without Justin Herbert, cannot be any worse. It cannot be better than us, and, that, and trust me, I hear you. They're bound to fall a handful more spots. They got the Buffalo Bills this week. I can't see them winning that game in an upset fashion. So they're heading down the sport. I do this week over week. I don't like over, you know, knee, knee-jerk reactions. I don't like predicting the Chargers are going to be the 29th team. They'll get there in good time if they suck. So the Chargers down five spots. Vikings, Steelers both lose games. The Steelers, they were up 13 nothing and then lose by 17 plus. Like, how does that happen? And, like, tackling, pitiful. Run defense against Trey Sermon and, you know, another backup. Embarrassing. Like, couldn't stop the run whatsoever. And then Michael Pittman gets hurt and something called DJ Montgomery scoring touchdowns on you. Like, a steal, I mean, they, they just looked abysmal. Um, three straight seasons with a three-game losing streak since the first time since the 40s for the Steelers, which is crazy. So, yeah, I don't know, man. It feels like Tom was starting to lose that locker room, which is his kind of calling card. So, I don't know. A lot of things to watch there in Pittsburgh. It's not a good time to be a Steelers fan. Vikings, you know, they kept it competitive. Nick Mullins definitely wasn't great. He had a couple throws in there where, you know, you can see he orchestrates the offense. He's accurate enough. He can play with timing. But also he gets, like, taken to the ground and chucks a pick right into the lap of DJ Reader. So it's like, what do I do with that? So he's up and down. He's inconsistent. He will be the reason that games are close, both for a good and for a bad reason moving forward for the Minnesota Vikings. I think that's just the world that the Vikings are going to live in until maybe they turn it over to Jaron Hall. Saints are up three spots. They looked really good against the Giants. Now, granted, I it, you know, I think Derek Carr, even you know, with him struggling this year, like he's an NFL starter. Tommy DeVito was an NFL backup, so they had a QB edge there. And Dennis Allen had one of those games where it's like, okay, there's the Saints defense. That's really, really good. There you go. Good to see that happen. Um, I think they put together a good game plan against the Giants, uh, really using the blitz and putting a lot of pressure on that O-line as well as DeVito. Get a good game out of Derek Carr um, and you know, did it all without Chris Olave. So really impressive performance there from the Saints and one that they needed to get back into the playoff picture. Uh Packers are down two spots. Buccaneers beat them. They're up two spots. The Bucs look legit, and the Packers' defense look like Swiss cheese. So Joe Barry, he's kind of the last of these Vic Vangio disciples, which is really interesting, especially after Staley gets fired. It's like Joe Barry's the last of these disciples, and then Vic Fangio is still one of the better DCs. He's the highest-paid DC in the NFL. So, like, copycat league uh, hasn't copycatted that Vangio defense all that well. Um, and then the other week where the Packers' offense didn't look that great. So good on uh, Todd Bowles for finding enough defensive stops, especially in the secondary. They did just enough. Uh, to keep the Packers, especially late in that game, from making the comeback. And then, you know, Green Bay's defense really let them down in this one. Uh, tough. And then uh, I want to ask a quick question here while we're just randomly talking about it. I've been sitting on this for a few weeks. I think Jaden Reed's the best package receiver they got. Like, I know Christian Watson's hurt right now, but you think of those receivers, Watson, Dobbs, and Reed, they're all young. I, I think just Reed's the best of those three. So, Packers fans, let me know what you think about that. Like, I don't think it's a hot take whatsoever, but I just want to know where you're at, kind of what those guys right now. Is Watson your favorite? Do you think Dobbs is the most upside? Is it, is it Reed? Do you agree with me? Love to know your thoughts on that. And then for the box, man, more Mike Evans. And this was finally the week. I've been saying for a while. It's like, it's Mike Evans and no one else. This week, they got Chris Godwin involved, plus Rashad White, an awesome pass catcher in another big game. Had to play him in fantasy this week. That wasn't great. But, and James Cook, the dude had both. It was crazy. But, um, yeah, like the full passing attack was put on display. Kate Otten catches up, you know, like, felt like they opened up the entire offense and said, Baker, we're not just going to like lean on the run and have you throw to 13. We're going to have you be the focal point of the offense. And they tore Green Bay up. So, man, it, it's starting to get to the point where it's like, I can't see where Baker's not their quarterback next year. And I can't see where Dave Canales isn't their OC next year. So I think they're going to keep that rolling into the next season and keep that continuity and see where it takes them. Uh, and then it makes it really interesting. What do you do with Mike Evans? Colts up two spots. They just absolutely obliterated the Steelers. Shane Sykin's still doing a great job. They're doing enough with Gardner Minshew. Trace Sermon breakout game. They ran the ball well without their top two guys, which you know speaks to that offensive line and what Shane Sykin's doing from a blocking standpoint, scheme-wise. Um, 
And then even when Michael Pittman got hurt, like they're still able to scheme guys open and get a lot of production. So the Colts are a much better team than the Pittsburgh Steelers. And, and they're in the playoff picture, so they deserve to be in the top 16. Rams are out in state put just because, you know, the Bengals won. And there's not a whole lot of movement ahead of them, but still very, very impressed with this Rams team. Yeah, Washington made it close at the end, but man, Sean McVay's on a heater. Stafford's, you know, dropping dimes left, right, and center with Cup, with Puka, with Kyron Williams. That's a really nice three-headed monster of like a skill group guys around Stafford to go with it. Bengals won uh, and in comeback fashion. And T. Higgins, oh my God, that second touchdown is out of this world. Sick to watch. Um, we'll see what happens with Jamar Chase moving forward. But Jake Browning, man, like I've been saying, like he is as confident a backup quarterback as there is in the league right now. Man has moxie, man has swagger through the roof. Um, and he's run that offense with good timing. He's a good decision maker. Like he, he's really played really, really well. And like to the point where like he, he's going to get like really high end backup money whenever he hits the market. Uh, or there's going to be a team that maybe gets him a starting opportunity, you know, or he's kind of that fringe, you know, bridge guy, you know, like we'll start him because he's like QB 30 in the league right now, but we're going to draft a guy and hopefully he's our long term answer. Like I think Keith Browning, or excuse me, Keith Browning, Jake Browning's opening up doors for him beyond Cincinnati, or he could just stay and just be the backup of the future for the Bengals. But good on him, man. He's an awesome story, especially getting a win against the Vikings who cut him. And if you are a football fan, you've already seen that clip. So good on him. It's a really fun story. And the Bengals continue to stay competitive. Broncos and Seahawks basically flipped these two. Broncos, disappointing loss, man. I, I really liked them uh, as a matchup against the Lions, but their run defense was absolutely putrid. Gibbs finds the end zone twice. We'll talk about the Lions later on. But ultimately, I, I said on the hurry-up offense last week, if you like the Lions, juice up. Instead of going money line, because that's not going to have any value, juice up. I'm going to run St. Brown stats, because clearly you're saying he's going to win the matchup against McMillan. Like, it's Jaquan McMillan. I'm going to run St. Brown. To me, that was what that game hinged on. Um, and then if you're a Broncos fan, like, bet the unders on I'm going to run St. Brown and uh, maybe a couple picks from Jared Goff, some sacks in there, and you're going to say that the Broncos defense gets pressure and takes away ASP. And, and ultimately, it was more the first rather than the second. There were Amon Ron St. Brown, seven catches, 100 plus yards, and a touchdown. Like, big day for him. Obviously, three touchdowns for Sam Laporta. Huge showing from him. So, yeah, just the Lions getting back on track. The Broncos' defense disappointing. And now they, they're in a pretty precarious spot going into next week because uh, they need to win out uh, if they're going to have a chance to make the playoffs. Uh, Jags, they lost, but they're a weird team because, like, up. And through that Jamal Agnew touchdown, I think they were the better team. I think legitimately they were the better side uh, through that Jamal Agnew, Agnew touchdown. It just was with two 50 plus yard missed field goals, which you can never rely on a kicker, no matter how good, to consistently make those. And, you know, the Trevor Lawrence fumble, and then you run out of time in the first half. Like, they just kept shooting themselves in the foot. And then they got the touchdown, which should have been like the breaking point where they release, and it's like, okay, the Jags are going to make this comeback. And then from that point on, the Ravens were the better team. It's, that game was super weird, but. I'm not worried about the Jags. I, like, I saw enough there to where I was like, this team can move the football. They just got to finish. Um, and I tend to be someone like, you know, I, I'm a play-by-play -play broadcaster on top of what I do here in my full-time job. And like sometimes you'll just get a basketball game, which I'm calling a lot right now, where you'll see a team where they're moving the ball really well and they're getting good shots, but the shots just aren't falling. And to me, I'm more impressed with like, okay, the process is there. The results will eventually come. Um, and I think that's, I think that last week kind of showed me that like, okay, the Jags are, are getting there. This just wasn't the week where the results and, and the execution were maybe there. But, you know, give it another week or so where they clean up the turnovers. They don't run out of time in the first half. You know, they're making field goals for 50 plus. This this place is a different game and the Jags are a different, you know, outlook then. Um, and you almost wonder just from a confidence standpoint, like those field goals go in. Lawrence doesn't fumbles, doesn't fumble and that becomes a touchdown. Like how different does that game feel? Like, you know, like and how, what does the rest of the game play like for the Jacks? Because they probably have a ton of confidence and swagger on their side, you know, so it's just interesting. Seahawks, man, true lock. What an awesome comeback win there. And just dropping a dime in the bucket to DK and then JSN. I mean, just, whew. I mean, the guy has arm talent. Like there was no doubt about that coming out of Missouri. It was just the other things that needed to be coached up. And I think kind of like Geno Smith, like he's just sat long enough and he's been learning this whole time. Um, and you hear him after the game just talking about getting his opportunities. So it's really cool to see him take advantage of that. And uh, it's good receivers around him. They can continue to win. But I do think it's going to be Geno next week when they head to Tennessee. So that's a that's a, that's a a line I like a lot. Seattle right now favored by two and a half on the road to Tennessee. I just think they're a much better team. And I've been saying for weeks now, they are one of the most seven talented teams in the NFC. So it was good to see them get a win, get back to 500. And now hopefully they march on towards the playoffs the rest of the year. Texans, I'm going to have them stay at 10. Same thing with the Browns here. You know, for Houston, uh, just a gutty win. It wasn't pretty, not by any stretch, and they fell behind early, but Case Keenum did just enough. Uh, and, you know, Noah Brown, huge numbers, which on that note, like, Nico Collins would be crazy to leave. Um, I think Michael Pittman has made a lot of money uh, in Indianapolis. He's found a nice home in that Shane Sykin offense. Makes sense for him to resign and for Indianapolis to want to resign him. And the same is true with Nico Collins. Like, he's assuming Bobby Slowick stays there as the OC. This is a great offense. They found a great role for him, and he's putting up huge numbers. And this week, he's out, and then Noah Brown does the exact same thing in that same role. So, like, all the sense in the world for Nico Collins to come back and just continue to be a really productive player and make good on the money that he'll be paid. Um, 
And now I think they're going to get CJ Stroud back. So also one other note, like them taking away Derrick Henry in the run game, like that's a D'Amico Ryan stat to me more, more than anything. Like run defense takes talent, but it also takes buy-in. And I mean, oh my God, the turnaround from this Texans run defense from years prior to this year, like Derrick Henry used to own the Texans. This year, they said, uh uh-uh. So, huge credit there to D'Amico Ryans. Browns at nine. I mean, full Joe Flacco experience. He's shit for three quarters and then just all of a sudden turns into a demon dropping laser beams like the the touchdown pass to Amari Cooper in the fourth quarter. So, good on him for clutching up. And that's really all this team, this Browns team needs, especially when they're at home because that defense plays out of its world when it's at home. They have some enough receiver talents, really Amari Cooper, and then you're just kind of figuring out what other friends can do what. Um, an efficient enough run game, a good enough offensive line. They just need Joe Flacco to not lose games and every once in a while make one or two throws to, you know, specifically Mark Cooper. Also a big day for David and Joku again. Just one or two throws to where it's like, okay, yep, that's enough offense. Our defense could do the rest. So uh, not the prettiest of wins for those two sides. Sorry for my screen spazzing out there. I don't know what OBS was on. Uh, but then we get on to our top eight. Detroit Lions are going to stay put. Really impressive win, but I just didn't have anywhere to put them. Uh, Lions, another you know blowout win, but it came you know against the Jets who aren't all that great. Nowhere really to put them because I still think this top six, these are probably still the six best teams. Now I know there's Lions and, and Dolphins fans being like, did you see the Eagles? Like, Hurts is, is definitely hurt. That offense feels like it feels like a stick shift with someone not knowing how to drive a stick shift at the wheel. Like, too herky-jerky. doesn't really get going. They don't know what they're doing. They're, it, sometimes they get rolling, but then it's like it doesn't stay in motion versus someone who knows how to drive stick. Like, you don't even think about it, really, because it's super smooth. Um, that kind of feels like where the, Lion, the, excuse me, the Eagles are. So, I know there's Lions and, and Dolphins fans being like, they're not playing 100%. We have blowout wins. Why are we not moving up? I hear you. Um, but I still think the Eagles, when they're healthy and when Jalen Hurts is healthy, and specifically when they have Darius Slay, like, no slay in this one really hurt because Bradbury was rough. Slay at least gives them one shutdown guy. He's old, but like he's a shutdown guy. And with no with him off the field, it hurts obviously playing through the flu on top of already being a little banked up. It was just a tough combination there. They looked good in that first drive, uh, but everything after that was a little disappointing. But we know the strengths of these Eagles. Like the offensive line's great, the defensive line's great. Now we just need to get Hurts back on track, figure out that passing game. A lot of pressure on Brian Johnson, the OC, to figure that out. And then if Slay's healthy, I think there's enough there to keep that defense at least solid. So I like him right here at six, but honestly, if you're a Dolphins Lions fan, I hear you. I just, I like the entire resume of the Eagles. Plus, you know, they made it to the Super Bowl last year. And you know what? If they lose again next week, you're going to have your opportunity to move up and, and leapfrog Philadelphia. Chiefs up a spot. Rasheed Rice continues to prove that he's the guy. Kind of a quieter day for Travis Kelsey. But man, uh, good on the, the Chiefs too for their ingenuity, especially after those, like the Kelsey drops in the end zone. Jerk McKinnon touchdown, Clyde Edwards Hilaire touchdown. Like they're just literally throwing the ball to the, in the end zone to anybody who will come down with it. And if it's the running backs, fine. So Rasheed Rice getting the running backs more involved. Hopefully Kelsey gets back on track. That might be the way forward for this Chiefs team. Uh, but also a good bounce back game for that defense. Granted, against Bailey Zappi. But the Chiefs look like the Chiefs this week, which is a good sign. Cowboys down two spots. Look, this team might not be the same outside of its home confines. But also, like, they're, you're, sometimes you just run into a bad matchup. And I think the Bills kind of... They highlighted this this Dallas run defense is not great, especially without Jonathan Hankins. They drafted Mozzie Smith to be a run stopper. That's what he was at college, but he's just not there yet. Like you can't always expect a rookie to hit the ground running and be the exact, you know, fill that role that you're looking for. And I think that's kind of what this team's missing. And also we talked about on the hurry up offense last week where, you know, somebody had mentioned San Francisco when they have the lead, that's their most like that's the thing they need the most. Same's true about Dallas too, because like when they get to dictate their like pace of play and uh, how they want the game script to be played. They're awesome. Um, and when they land that first punch and they're keeping teams and specifically defenses on their toes with that offense with a good balance of run pass, it, it's it's a tough offense to slow down. But when you fall behind, it's it's not quite the same. Also, them out of the stadium might be an interesting note. Like this is going to be something to monitor moving forward. Um, but I will say this to me, this was a big game. Like this this is not quite San Francisco, Philadelphia, but this was a, this is a playoff type of game. And they lost. So like. Another one of those big games where the Cowboys fall short, you know, so um, something to monitor there for sure. Um, they still got a couple other big time matchups the rest of the season, so they need to uh, put up or shut up, including this week at Miami. You know, it's it's not Buffalo weather, but it's not at home, not on that turf. So how do they play against Miami Dolphins? I'm fascinated to see. The Bills are up to number three. I know their record's not great, but I think Josh Allen is playing as good as any quarterback in the league right now. Um, maybe the best quarterback in the league right now. And I mean, and I say that acknowledging he did not win this game. Like this was the James... Cook showcase, but it comes with both those things. Like when Allen is asked to throw the football, he's playing like maybe the best quarterback in the league. And now they got James Cook fully antiquated in that offense, whether the receiver, but also as the lead back. And, and and maybe that was just the fundamental difference between Ken Dorsey and Joe Brady. Ken Dorsey just didn't see James Cook that light, and Joe Brady did. Maybe that was the fundamental difference between those two. 
But they continue to work underneath. We got a little bit more Stephon Diggs this week. Not a lot, but you know, given how much Josh Allen threw the ball, a good bit more than what we've seen in the last couple of weeks. So I think this offense is really starting to find itself, really. Um, and moving forward, I, like I'd, I'd be surprised if like James Cook isn't touching the ball twenty times a week between you know receptions and, and true rushing uh, attempts. And then I think that opens up a lot more for this offense and uh, specifically him as a receiver and then working Dalton Kincaid underneath and um, also using Dawson Knox in that and then Khalil Shakir as the yards after the catch guy. That then opens up those deep, deep shots for Stephon Diggs. But again, they even use him underneath too. So I just think Joe Brady is really, I think ultimately the fundamental difference on top of James Cook is like this offense now is looking to, like if this is the line of scrimmage, looking to start underneath and work deep versus I think Ken Dorsey was always looking for the big play and then work yourself to the check down, which offenses do it both ways. I'm not saying one way or another is right or wrong, but I think maybe Josh Allen does operate better looking uh, short and then trying to, and then maybe seeing that big play open up and then just timing those deep shots. Kind of like what Sean Payton has the Broncos doing where it's like primarily they're looking to attack underneath and then they'll time up those big time threats. Or if Russ sees something open deep down the field, he takes it, you know, so maybe that's just the Bills uh, the rest of the way. Um, and then the Ravens up two spots. It still wasn't pretty. Like I said, I think the Jags were the better side for a half, you know, or so. Um, but that being said, the Ravens still ultimately won. And uh, it wasn't the prettiest of passing attacks, but that's where, like, Lamar Jackson run, rushing for almost 100 yards, like, pays dividends. Um, losing Keith Mitchell, I think, definitely hurts. Um, but, yeah, now they got an awesome game this upcoming week. And this is going to be a Mike McDonald showcase, right? Like, they got San Francisco on Christmas Day at 8 o'clock. Like, if Mike McDonald takes, it slows down San Francisco, who obviously comes in at 1, that's his, like, make me a head coach type of game. So, or if he's just that, maybe, you know, it's another coaching, you know, it's another year away before he gets that opportunity. So, big game for him uh, and a big game for this Ravens offense. Can they go toe-to-toe with the San Francisco 49ers who come in at number 1? That offense is clicking. The defense is elite. You've heard me say it for weeks now. Even when they had those three-game losing streaks, they didn't fall out of my top five just because, look, they're the best team in the league. Like, and it's pretty it's pretty clear now. And uh, and if they get that one seed, which, by the way, like, Dallas is really fortunate that Philadelphia lost because that kept the opportunity for them to get the one seed and, and at least one home playoff game by maybe win the division alive because if they lost and Philadelphia wins, they have a really easy schedule the rest of the way, like... That would have been done deal. Philadelphia, uh, Dallas is playing on the road throughout the rest of the playoffs. But that being said, to that point, like if if everything goes through San Francisco in the NFC, like I just don't see how Dallas is winning that. And I maybe Philadelphia can give them a game. That's the one I can give you. But with Brock Purdy, I, even that I'm kind of iffy on. I'm really iffy on right now, given where the Eagles are. So if all roads, you know, all roads lead through San Francisco to, on the way to the NFC or uh, NFC Championship game, like. Mwah. I just don't see a team beating San Francisco. I just, like I said, I think they're the best team in the league right now. But excited to see them take on the Ravens on Christmas uh, night. But also, Merry Christmas uh, in an early addition to everyone uh, who celebrates. And happy holidays to those who don't. Uh, uh, that's going to do it for my power ranking. So I <laughs> appreciate you checking in tomorrow. We got the Hurry Up Offense preview and all the games. And I'm going to try to get a mock draft out this weekend as well for you guys to enjoy just before Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. But again, if you don't come back to the channel before then, happy holidays and an early happy uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. So... Hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. And until next time, my name is Teach, and I am signing off.